In the prayer book, you notice we said the Apostles' Creed, and I want to draw your attention to, in this verse, how we have almost the middle of the Apostles' Creed in this verse. And um, so what the Creed does, when you see that Christ was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from thence, now the creed goes on, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And um, so it reminds us of, of the judgment. It takes this scripture and goes on, and it obviously builds together in the creed a whole range of the most central doctrines, if you could like, of the scriptures. And it goes on later on about the forgiveness of sins uh, in there, the uh, work of the Holy Spirit in, in the church. And um, yet, so it begins with God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we believe in. We state that and then in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then the, the summary of Jesus Christ. How do you sum up things about Jesus Christ here? Well, he was conceived. Well, he's, he, firstly, he's the Son of God, as we see. And he's our Lord. He is conceived by the Holy Ghost, but born of the Virgin Mary. And then, straight through his life, from his birth to his death, nothing else said, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Nothing about his miracles. Nothing about his, his, his preaching isn't, isn't, even, isn't even referred to here. But straight through uh, to the end and suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead and buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And then our text here adds in, in verse 34, that he also maketh intercession for us. So in heaven... He's, he's interceding for us. That bit is not included in the creed, but it's it, we, we can think, well, he's at the right hand of the Father, and the creed's brief, is very brief, obviously, but it, it isn't mentioning that he's, um, that the fact of his intercession uh, for us. And it's uh, similar in, in, in the Nicene Creed, in the communion service, uh, which is on page 251 in the prayer book. If you want to look up that. Um, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, no, this, that's the confession. Sorry, just... Um, the creed is just before there on uh, page 240. This is the Nicene Creed. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Similar beginning, adding on the visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and then this a bit more description, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, I mean, light of light, very God of very God, means he truly is God, begotten, not made, so he, he was never uh, he was never made, he was always there, but there's, there's this eternal begottenness, being of one substance with the Father, so uh, uh, the same deity by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, so it reminds us that he came from heaven when he was incarnate, he was already there from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And then it continues again with the similar subjects as before, referring to the Holy Spirit and the work in the church. And there's also a Another creed from slightly later, the, the Apostles' Creed from the 2nd century. 
early second century, so very, very early. So it wasn't the actual apostles who compiled it, but you can see already this central part of it here in Romans chapter eight that he he uh, that Christ died is risen again and at the right hand of God the Father. So a very central part of the creed, right in the middle of this epistle to the Romans. Um, I would just turn you to the Athanasian Creed, which is on page 27. And if we read on um, through there, quite a while into it, we go down to the bottom of page 29 he says he, who suffered for our salvation descended into hell, hell rose again the third day the third day from the dead he ascended into heaven he sitteth on the right hand of the father god almighty from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead at whose coming more description all men shall rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their own works and etc so when jesus christ returns then everyone will be raised with their bodies again to give an account they have a resurrection body incidentally some to some to uh, everlasting blessing and some to condemnation um, so this is the return of jesus christ so in the meantime he's there sitting at the right hand sometimes he was seen to be uh, standing but he is at the right hand of God whether he stands or sits in in heaven where he has ascended and he's making intercession for his people now this the point I want to make here is that when the creed was put together it was a great statement of what we believe and so in there was much persecution of the church and not many people would have had a Bible but they could have this summary, a very brief summary of what we believe. And they could say this and declare it and remind themselves, I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was born, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, and then suffered, was crucified, dead and buried. He rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he's coming again. And they could add that part on into it which the, the Bible teaches throughout. Jesus Christ has promised he's coming again. And these texts would give the Christian, in times of suffering, great confidence. And in fact, to turn to it as it is in our passage in Romans, which, um, of course, the whole of the Bible really is our creed. We believe the whole Bible. We don't just believe parts of it, but how it is helpful to have these summaries and to learn key verses uh, you can learn as much of the Bible as you can but to have a summary such as the creed to remember I said this morning wake up say to yourself I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord and you can remember these things and then when you come to pray you're praying to the God of truth. You're not just praying in vague ways with odd words and just, um, if you think about it, when, when it's to be explained about Jesus Christ. People need to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. But they need to know more than just, oh, you're a sinner, Jesus is the saviour. Well, where, where, where does this all come from? Well, from God, the Father Almighty. And then from Jesus being... Um, conceived by the Holy Ghost so God coming into the world and then being crucified and suffering and crucified and buried and rising again and ascending into heaven and being there until he's coming to judge the world and it puts it in context then and they say well this is the Jesus Christ that I believe in so and it's interesting how it comes here I say that there's a context with the creeds of being able to defend the faith, to know what you believe. We've got to know who you believe in. What are you trusting in? When you're challenged, when you're in trouble. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Because this is what Jesus Christ has done for me. 
and this is who God is and so these things can be very very encouraging and, it, and I'm, I'm saying all this because it starts off verse 34 with the question who is he that condemneth and this is a response it is Christ that died, yea, that is risen again, who is at the right hand of the Father, who maketh intercession for us. And then it goes on, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody can. Nobody can. But you see, this little, this, this mini creed, if you like, this, this central part of the creed, it's Christ that died, yea, Christ is risen again. Yes, he's at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. He's for us that believe on him, for his people. But the elect, in verse 33, against whom no charge can be made because God justifies sinners by Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, by God's grace. The sinner, as we said last week, is counted righteous. The blood of Christ cleanses from sin. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord our righteousness. He was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Perfect, full, sufficient salvation by the sacrifice of God the Son on the cross. This is where we stand. And so it is that we often may feel condemned. The question's put, who is he that condemneth? Why is a Christian able to stand? Well, the answer, Christ died. Christ is risen again. Christ is at the right hand. He makes intercession for us. And the creed that I've been referring to takes us up in the context of Jesus Christ coming back to judge the world. He's going to divide the sheep and the goats. But for those of us who can say, who can condemn us? Would he condemn us? Well, no. It says in John chapter 3 and verse 17, the very purpose of what Jesus Christ came to do. What did he come to do? He, did he come to save or to condemn? It says here, John 3, I'll read verse 16 as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. He could have done. He could have come and said, look at you, you're all unrighteous. But he came that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Jesus Christ is that light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Well, the great work of God, of course, is, as Jesus said elsewhere, to believe on him, to believe on Jesus Christ. That is, is the greatest work. Now, you, you can't produce that out of any way. You can't just come up and say, well, I've decided to believe. I, I don't believe that our, our, our um, hearts and souls are fitted in such a way. We only can believe if uh, God... Um, causes us to believe now that may sound like a strange thing because we're commanded to believe but what we're actually doing is trusting and so you need some evidence perhaps to know that you can trust in Jesus Christ and well here, here we have it that God sent him into the world that those that believe on him should not or trust in him should not perish but have everlasting life yes, because Jesus came as a sacrifice, the only sacrifice, the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews said, could never take away sin. Old Testament sacrifice, one after another, but this was the one offering that the Son of God was, was, was going to make himself. He died, the just 
for the unjust. Uh, John, uh, first epistle of John, chapter one. The first epistle of John. So just before Revelation, just before James, then there are three epistles of John, one, two, and three. The first epistle, and chapter one, and verse eight and nine. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in the verse before actually it says that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ died the just for the unjust to save. He condemned sin. You see, this phrase about condemnation, who is he that condemneth? It's answered by the fact that Christ died. So all the condemnation that there would be was in him. That's, you could say, is scandalous. It's shocking. But it's the way that God was, was able, if you could say able, we don't use able with the reference to God, because God's almighty. But it was the way that he ordained for... Uh, the condemnation that would come upon sinners which we've all gone astray like lost sheep but it's the way that it was taken by Christ so in, in earlier in Romans chapter 8 in verse 3 which we were looking at some time ago it says for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh because of our fleshly nature we couldn't just keep the law it, it wasn't able to work God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So in Christ coming in the flesh in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. So uh, sin was uh, condemned as it were. Uh, it's been dealt with by Jesus Christ in his death on the cross and uh, one we referred to previously 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 the last verse of 2 Corinthians it's on page 1167 says for he hath made him to be sin for us so by Jesus Christ being sin you can see well he could completely shatter it couldn't he because who, who, he knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him you think well that's not fair it's not fair on Jesus Christ to make him sin but then that's the way that he took away our sin and he he bore it and he, he bore it in his body on the cross. That is the way to understand his death. That's what, what it was, a sacrifice. And so a sacrifice is done for sin and for others. And that's how it was done. That's what um, settled the righteousness of God, God's justice. And that God is just is most um, appropriate for his holiness. He's not a random God or anything, but a God of, of justice. And justice was met. And you know probably perfectly well, if it hadn't have been met by Jesus Christ, you would not be able to answer this question, who is he that condemneth? You would be feeling that there could indeed be condemnation upon you. Now, I suppose they don't talk like this a lot in some churches, the subject wouldn't come up. But people are guilty. People do 
feel guilty. They feel themselves condemned. They let God down. I know I heard someone say, I would never, I, I would never let God down. Thought, never see that. But we do. We, we continually yes. let God down. We don't love the Lord with all our heart. Yeah, we can never. So we can never. We would love to. We'd love to say. We may have the aim. Uh, where another friend used to say, God has given us His best, and we should give Him our best. Well, that's a good aim. That's a good ambition. So you can never do it. But we can never do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're right. We can never do it. We would love to be without sin, and it's in that verse we read there in. Yet it's as we read in First John that um, if if we say we're without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But He is faithful and just. Faithful, He has a promise that He will forgive us. He's just because uh, in Jesus Christ He He suffered the just for the unjust, that He could uh, bring us uh, to God. My blood, Jesus so, Christ. There's no, there's no help, and people will easily feel condemned, and in fact they are condemned without Jesus Christ. Christ. But here, the Christian can make this statement: Who is he that is condemned? It is Christ that died. Christ has died for my sins, and so I'm not condemned. That is absolutely amazing, and as we've read elsewhere. That is no excuse for us to carry on in sin and to say, well, that means I can do anything I want. No. If anyone says that, they haven't known Jesus Christ at all. They've got, because if you know Jesus Christ has died for your sins, you are amazingly thankful that you've been saved. You've been saved from condemnation. You've been saved from God's wrath. And our response is that we know that God has loved us and given Jesus Christ for us. And our response is, well, as we said of um, Saul of Tarsus to do, when he, he said, what will you have me to do? What, what should I do? And um, i just uh, turn you to, to that if you weren't, didn't hear it this morning in Acts chapter 9, when he was stopped on the, on the road to Damascus. And, he, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? And in verse 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, that is Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He immediately responded with obedience, wanting to obey Jesus Christ. He must he had seen him, he'd, he'd come to him, he could have come and condemned him, he could have struck him down as um, they, the um, Ananias and Sapphira were in Acts chapter 5. But here Jesus comes actually with mercy to Paul and he says that he's come for him, uh, though he's, he's been struck down, he has got something for him to do and he will go and send him away and that he shall then be able to preach the gospel and to go and to um, to to go and to preach the gospel and to bring glory to God whereas he's been he'd been an utter shame trying to destroy the church um, so this is a reaction of when someone becomes a Christian and they say, well, what should I do, what, what do I do now? It is quite a, a question really. But the one thing we know that we, that we, the being free from condemnation yeah. is that we're actually free to serve the Lord with gladness rather than out of a sense of, um, uh, uh, there's a burden if you like, but there's a, there's a sense of obligation upon us. Those, to whom much has been given, much will be required. And what more could be given than to be given everlasting life in Jesus Christ? So our whole life then is, is dedicated to God. We've still got to do our daily chores. We've got to still got to brush our teeth or whatever, uh, cook food, go to work or uh, do other duties, uh, care for others. Well, this all then, but then everything that's done, as um, uh, Martin Luther said, he said that the milkmaid can milk the cow to the glory of God. 
because everything she's doing is inspired by this new life, this thankfulness to God. And so this being free from condemnation is not an excuse for sin, but it's a spur for thankfulness, for joyfulness, and for being busy and getting on in a good way, serving the Lord, being able to pray, ask God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Ask God for these things and see over the time how he answers these prayers. But that's so Christ has died, so there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 1 There is therefore now no condemnation, verse 1 of chapter 8, to them who, which are in Christ Jesus, who, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. See, that's the spirit that's then working in a believer, bringing out this uh, love and joy and peace and the other fruits of the spirit. That, that cause us to want to serve the Lord and so the second thing here is that, that encourages the Christian who may feel condemned is that Christ is well he puts even rather it isn't just that Christ died Jay, rather that he's risen again who is even at the right hand of God now he has risen again and it's very important to get these things into our minds it's not just that Jesus died on the cross and that's the end of it we may think about that sometimes you may think to yourself well Jesus died for my sins that's it and it, 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 as you say as we've been saying we're free from condemnation because Christ died for our sins you could end there but he doesn't end there he, he adds more emphasis and I, I may have said to you this before when we're trying to think about something I believe that God has been very good he's given us a multi-dimensional uh, Bible if you like so you can take one thought and then another and you can go back and forth between them rather than drifting off going say Christ died and then you're, you're stuck is it well you've thought of that thought where do you go next Christ has risen and you, your, your thoughts can move on. Christ is at the right hand of God. Christ is interceding for his people. Then Christ is coming again. And these, this gives us a pattern of thought to concentrate our minds on, on the things that assure us. Now you can't necessarily be doing this all day long, but there's little parts of the day when you can remind yourself of where Jesus Christ is, what he's done. No, it's not. He rose from the you see, dead. you can just think that he died, and that's a, that is very. I'm not going to say we glory in the cross of Christ. We don't glory in anything but the cross of Christ. But we can to, to say after here, as the apostle does, yea, rather that he's risen again. It doesn't mean he's saying, well, I'd rather that Christ just rose from the dead and didn't die on the cross. He doesn't mean that. But what he's he is he is saying is. Yes, he died, but when I'm fully condemned, I can be sure that Christ died for my sins, but I've got more. I've got even more assurance. It's hard to imagine you can have more, more assurance. But we can. There's, you see, when a Christian becomes, a person becomes a Christian, they put their trust in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so that's it I've got everlasting life but then we're to grow in the grace we're to as it were to mature but, but and we get a you will find also as you go along it may start off relatively easy as a Christian and then as you go on God sends you with some more challenges and so you need to be more prepared. You need to build up, build up your strength, as it were. I've, I've told you the story of the elderly lady. She was getting old, and she said, "What I found out, I need to. Keep, you need to keep strong legs, because then when you get old, you can walk. Keep your legs as strong as you can, and you can keep moving. And it's like that in the Christian faith." Some of people talk about exercising the faith muscle. I'm not sure whether that's quite a biblical illustration. But what it says is that if we keep on trusting Jesus Christ, then as the challenges come, we'll be more ready for them. We'll be, 
suddenly Bible verses come to us to help us when we thought we were in such a difficult situation we remember I will never leave thee nor forsake thee various texts will come to us and you think that is really good that's that God, said that, yes that's really good that God is like that and so it is with the doctrines of the of the life of Christ and the things that happen as you build them up that he was incarnate by the Holy Ghost how wonderful that God came into the world but when he was there born of the Virgin Mary and then oh, he suffered then he died or oh, he died for my sins but rather he's risen and then we we now it's not that the that the resurrection did more than the cross some people could make a mistake there thinking the whole burden of sin was taken on the on the cross but it says in and the whole sacrifice was made but as it were the 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 um, resurrection was the proof how would the disciples have known for sure if Jesus had just died on the cross and then he was gonna one day come back from the grave and reappear and he, he know he went to the heavens to the right hand of the father where he'd come from it that was the, the way that it happened and it happened through the resurrection and so he's alive and there's a much there's a true sense that he really did conquer death death didn't have any dominion over him so though he died he conquered it he conquered the the all the punishment that would have that the sin was bearing it was fully paid off as it were so that death and it, it ended it, it, death couldn't continue it was impossible because he had he couldn't be dead any longer because he'd done all of the sacrifice was done and he was alive again so the resurrection gives the Christian a great hope and it's to be an encouragement Dr Lloyd-Jones said that the resurrection helps with our assurance that we have really been saved from sin from the devil uh, from from the law from death and from hell and uh, I'll give you a couple of um, instances on, on this Hebrews chapter 2 so Hebrews chapter 2 and just after all of Paul's epistles well it's the last of Paul's epistles and Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil so he's destroyed him that had the power of death so if he's destroyed the devil that had the power of death then he's destroyed death and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage so uh, I, I don't know about yourselves but the you for another for example you, you could be very content yes Jesus has died for me he's died for all his people and then there's a sort of death well we know people that have died yours years maybe parents grandparents you know they're not here but if if they're in Christ they're alive they 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 they, they aren't resurrected yet but they're with they're with Christ and they're alive with him and uh, so he's conquered death and hell and the devil <laughs> in his death and he's risen again but it says in in first Corinthians chapter 15 and and verse 19 um, that if 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 Christ isn't risen there's a lovely chapter on the resurrection if you ever well, I hope you all get a chance to, to read it 1 Corinthians 15 yes 1 Corinthians 15 it all explains about the resurrection and how it how it would all be and then in verse 19 he gives that assurance if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable strange strange verse you may think what he's saying if if 
if you give, if if you turn from sin to, and and you're suffering persecution or being ostracized or people are mocking you, what you've become a Christian for that, and it's only for this life. Well, it's miserable. You would say, well, if if you're only here for this life, well, eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't matter what you do. There's no judge at the end. Do what you like. This is what the, how the world goes on, isn't it? This is why the world's in, in the state that it's in. Because it has this attitude that it's only for, they're only here for this life. Make the most of your life as long as you've got health. You, that's the most yeah, important thing. Like and all that and all that sort of stuff. But the Christian, if we were like that, we'd be the most miserable because we have to deny ourselves and follow Christ, take up our cross. We have to resist sin and evil and temptation. We can't just go along with the, with everything, and so we'd be the most miserable if it was only in this life we have hope. But now is Christ risen from the dead, so the Christian's got a whole different approach. We're waiting for Christ to return, and so we've got to be ready. We've got to be like the five wise virgins with our lamps full of oil, ready, ready to be lit for Jesus Christ. And we see this in Romans chapter 6, verse 8 onwards. A great passage that we've been through some months ago. Romans 6, verse 8. It puts it like this, this language to describe the Christian being dead and alive. Are you dead or alive? Well, it says here, Now if we be dead with Christ, we're crucified with Christ, you see. We believe that we shall also live with him. It's a bit like if you were waiting for something to be married, isn't it? Well, it, the, the day is described as the, as the wedding of the Lamb, of the Son of God, to be married to the church. We're waiting for this great wedding day. And so we're dead to everything else. We're waiting for our bridegroom to appear because we shall live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, verse 9, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And then this is this thing, this reckoning. I remember we spoke about this some months ago. Likewise, this is an account, reckoned. Think of it, think it, it says, think like this. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> and then down in verse 13 it says there neither yield ye yourselves your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead have you ever thought of yourself like that I was, I was dead now I'm alive those, think of yourself as being someone that's alive from the dead now I've got everlasting life with Jesus Christ and your members as instruments of righteousness. So use your, your mind and your body as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall and not have dominion do over you. Huh? Not all of you will do all this. No, no. But this is how we're to think, we're to renew our minds. It says in First Peter that we have a good conscience. We're to have a good conscience because of the resurrection. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? But it does, it does help us much to remember that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he's alive. It is a very wonderful. First Peter chapter 3 verse 21 speaks of baptism to begin with, saying that he's not talking about the water, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I say it's, it's hard, you can't really think of the resurrection and the cross separate. The cross was the full bearing of our sin, but the resurrection was the, uh, it was the vindication of it in uh, Romans 4 and verse 25, it's put like this, about Jesus our Lord who was delivered for our offences and was raised again 
for our justification. So you, you can then you can believe on him that because you know that his death was was the end of death, bearing sin and being alive from the dead. And then last verse I've got to quote you is from Ephesians chapter two, verses five and six. Oh, Ephesians. Uh, it takes a week for us to look them up. Ephesians chapter two, verses five and six. It says, "This is a description of of how of how the Christian is." And don't forget, we're talking about this is our our confidence in God, our assurance in God. Why why we're not condemned? Why there's no condemnation? Because Christ has died. Yea, rather is is risen again. And um, you sit here, uh, but but God, who is is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loves us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us that's not made you faster it's made you alive to, to be quick rather than dead the, the, the quick and the dead we talk about don't we he's quickened us together made us alive together with Christ by grace ye are saved God's gift and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that is really the the uh, the, the reality of it those who've been saved those who've, who've come to Jesus Christ we would, our sins made us dead separated from God so as, as being spiritually dead but then through faith in Jesus Christ's death a Christian is raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus now you saw I'm sitting here I'm not sitting in heaven but in your heart the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is among you. It's with you. Jesus Christ is with you by the Spirit. It says in the beginning of Ephesians that God uh, has blessed us, verse 3 of chapter 1, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Um, we're to set our hearts in Colossians chapter Three, just moving on a couple of epistles if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God set your affections on things above not on the earth for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God <laughs> well, I don't speak to uh, dead people very often but it says that you're dead but your life is hid with Christ in God your life is in heaven. You reckon yourself to be dead unto sin and alive unto God, all by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, these things are very wonderful, very wonderful things. And we shouldn't just have them for half an hour in a sermon and let them go. Do think on these things yeah, during the week. Think about the greatness of, God, of, of God Almighty. Uh, and go back to that creed again, which is this, is really the, these verses that almost then, this verse is almost taken and put straight into the creed. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. It's right in the middle of a statement of belief and it assures those that feel that they're condemned. Do take up the words of the creeds, try and learn them and be able to say them to yourself so you'll find that it's very very helpful to warm your heart when you feel bitter or weary or unbelieving or lost and confused and I believe and you assert these things and then you get this assurance that this is what Christ has done he's died, he's risen again and there's no condemnation. Who is he to condemn it? It's Christ has died for that condemnation. He has condemned sin. He has taken all that condemnation. He's taken all of our sin. And so we trust and believe in the death of Jesus Christ for our sins. And that he's raised for a justification. I, 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 I can't make you believe no, this. I'm saying there's enough here 
there's enough here to believe about Jesus Christ. So this is the this is the testimony of millions of people ever since that this is the thing that changed them. This is what changed the apostle Saul. He well, he got first hand evidence that Christ was alive and he spoke to him from heaven. But we don't we we have the work of the Holy Spirit which we also believe in so that he brings these things home to us very closely <laughs> and as uh, Peter says in his epistle though you haven't seen the Lord Jesus Christ you you can yet uh, love him and rejoice with joy unspeakable and these people said yes well that's, that's what it's like that's what it's like first Peter um, <clears throat> again just to I just read a few verses from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christ That's where the lively hope is going there. It's straight, straight into the resurrection. I wasn't thinking that. Sorry. If Christ is raised from the dead, we would be nowhere. Yeah, we'd be nowhere. But it's by the resurrection that we have this lively hope. And to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who you might be glad to know are kept by the power of God that's another important subject is that these things are done for the people of God and they're sure and they'll be kept now I think some of this comes up in following chapters on God's predestination but if you notice in back in Romans 8 there in verse 33 it says who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect that means that God has chosen his people so when they believe God has caused them to believe that's what I'm saying you can't make yourself believe it's something from God so then when you know you've believed you know that God has caused you to believe because God has given you everlasting life and therefore, where it says in Peter that that um, you're kept by the power of God, you can say, well, of course, that makes sense. He's He's got this purpose in me, back, back in verse 29 of Romans 8, to predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the what his, his purpose is, to make us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And then, because he's predestinated them, verse 30, he's called them, justified and glorified. It's God's purposes when you when you become part of it then you know that it's something that God has done it was never anything that we had done to choose ourselves so then uh, just I'd better skip on in that first Peter passage again whom having not seen verse 8 ye love haven't seen these disciples in the time of Peter they weren't there they become disciples later in different parts when the gospel was taken out and they had never seen Jesus Christ but he says whom having not seen you love how can we not help love when we have, God has worked in our heart to cause us to believe that Christ has died for our sins to save us there's no condemnation we've got everlasting life we love him we must love him <laughs> in whom though now you see him not you can't see him you can't how can you love someone you haven't seen it's amazing yet Believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here we have these precious words, rejoicing with joy unspeakable. I hope in any weariness that you may be going through, in any trials, in any troubles, if you were persecuted like the Apostle Paul was when he wrote from a jail he was chained up to a guard he preached to the guard when he wrote to the Philippians he said to them rejoice always rejoice in the Lord whatever happens don't let it stop you rejoicing in the Lord because it's a miracle that there's no condemnation Who can, no one can condemn you in Jesus Christ and that's not to be a license to sin, no, and you know it's not if you're a real Christian, it's the last no, thing. So yes, it was just me and you, is that? There could be, yeah, there can be. It was just me, yeah. There can be. There can be a false sense of people wanting a religion, but they, 
They, they want to know God, but they aren't prepared to confess that they're sinners oh. and they put their whole trust in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If they don't do that, then they have, then they have a religious mania mm -hmm. and they get, get obsessed with all sorts of ideas, usually thinking that they're Jesus Christ themselves is a very common one. And the only way they could be good enough is if they were actually Jesus Christ and they dream such things that they must be there for because it's the only possible answer. But in fact, it comes, it's almost, it, it gets very, it's very, very close because when we believe in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is counted to us. Mm -hmm. So we are in him, we're joined to him. We, we, do, we, we don't need to, it's almost as if we need to be him. The only way we could be saved would be if we were perfect like Jesus is. But it's not done by us thinking we are him. It's done by us trusting in him, putting our whole trust in him and confessing ourselves as sinners, but that he is our saviour. And then the religious mania is cured. There's a cure for it then, <laughs> if a person will trust in Jesus alone. And they'll find then that they have this peace with God. They have this great sense that this condemnation that would never be able to go away is gone. And then... Uh, they can they confess their sins daily, repent daily, uh, trust in the Lord, uh, affirm their faith, and then go about uh, seeking to serve the Lord, loving the Lord, loving our neighbours, wanting others to be saved, wanting to do all, not to bring shame on the Lord's name. It's it's a challenge and it's full of trials and um, pitfall. They go to the left too far, you fall in. Go to the right too far, you fall in. But thankfully, we trust if we're on the road, God, if we're, on, if we're in Christ, we will be kept by the power of God. He'll pull us back up again, bring us back round, set us back on course again. But the best way, you say, we don't want that chastening. We don't want the hard discipline of God by being disobedient. We want to keep on serving the Lord as faithfully as we can, bringing as much blessing as we can and praying fervently for our, our friends, our neighbours, that they would also come to the point where they are saved, come to Jesus Christ. What a wonderful saviour we have. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, we thank Thee, we worship Thee, Lord. We cannot give Thee the glory and the honour that we should because we still have an indwelling sinful nature. But we thank thee, Lord, that we're counted righteous in Jesus Christ. We thank thee he, that he is our righteousness. We thank thee that the power of God is, is for the people of God. We thank thee that the Holy Spirit is interceding. Christ Jesus is interceding. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that uh, um, <clears throat> spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that justifieth who is he that condemneth it is Christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us and Lord we thank thee that the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people, his blood for his people, is full and sufficient and powerful. Powerful and able to save his people. Oh Lord, we thank thee and we pray that each of us here will be found to be wise and to be in Christ and to abide in him. Lord, keep us on the narrow path. Keep us from straying. Deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. Lord, be merciful to thy people and bless us that we may live to thy glory and that we may be fruitful in our lives until that great day comes when we meet our Saviour and in the twinkling of an eye we'll be changed and we'll be like him and there'll be no more tears and no more sin. Oh Lord, bless thy people, we pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.